be crushed. I quoted a man by the name of Frederick Douglass. Said that Frederick Douglass was a slave in the United States. And what happens is that when the slaves were brought, the first thing that the master would do is that he would check them out, as we say, or test them. Who amongst them is proud? Who amongst them looks problematic? Who amongst them seems to be rebellious? And then they have a treatment for them. Now, Frederick Douglass lived in the state of Maryland. And Maryland had a law. See, a slave was considered property. You killed them, you beat them, they were your property. Chattels, which means movable property. So Frederick Douglass comes in and he sees this institution of slavery and he thinks to himself, I am not a slave. I don't belong here. He is not my master. I am not supposed to be subjugated by him. I am not supposed to be serving him. I refuse this. And it, that was expected from some slaves, but they had a treatment for it. That treatment was a white man by the name of Ed Covey. If you were a rebellious slave, they send you to Eddie, who used his whip very liberally, if you know what I mean. He goes there, and for six months, daily, Frederick Douglass is beaten. Every day. He is beaten. They would get him and he, they would just whip him. And the idea and the aim is to crush his soul, to crush his self-esteem and his self-pride, because that is very problematic. And then one day, in the words of Frederick Douglass, he said, I regained my self-respect. I did the unthinkable. What did he do? He fought back. The man is whipping him every time as a slave. You, when they whip you, you just surrender. You don't do anything. Because the state of Maryland had a law that said any slave that attacked his honor, the master, that is, his punishment was that he would be hanged, killed innocently. So now Frederick Douglass is here and he is being whipped for six months on a daily basis. What does he do? He fights back and the story goes on to say that he wrestled Ed Covey and he beat him severely. Then he said, that day, I regained my self-pride. That day, I regained my self-respect. I got my Izzah back and he said, it felt excellent. Even though the consequences could have been that I might die, but like they say, if you cannot live proudly, it is time to die proudly. But you cannot live in the state of humiliation. So he said, I regained my respect back. Similarly also, change was never done because the majority wanted. The majority is always a follower. I told the story of the sheikh that was invited to give a speech. And when he got to the place where he's supposed to be given the speech, not so many people showed up in the conference. So the organizers of the conference were not very happy with the turnout. Look, we've got this great place and very few people showed up and we invited this man from such a long distance and very few people are showing up. They were disappointed. The sheikh looked at them and said, do not be disappointed with your numbers. We are not looking for numbers amongst our faithful. We are looking for faith amongst our numbers. Change be it secular, be it religious, was never the result of the demand of the majority. Rather, it was a committed minority with Izza that led my brothers and sisters. If you do not think high of yourself, then there is, there is really no contribution to make. You have nothing to offer. To begin with, you do not see yourself as a holder of rights. You do not see yourself as someone that has something to give. And that is why Islamically such a thing is not acceptable. Going back to the minorities, you know how African Americans in the state got their civil liberties back? One day, a woman by the name of Rosa Park, she was sitting in the bus. Sitting in the bus, if you were black, you belong to the back, at the back of the bus. That's where you sit. That is where you sit because you were 
you know, at that point they were debating whether blacks were humans, three-fifths humans, some people said subhumans, some said equal humans but inferior, whatever it was. But the law, it was the state's law that if you were black, African Americans, you belong at the end of the bus. That's where you belong. So one day, an old woman, Rosa Park, she got on the bus and she said, you know what? Why am I sitting at the end of the bus? I pay as much as these people pay. Why am I sitting at the end of the bus? And what does she do? She goes and she sits in the very front seat in the bus. The driver sees this. Excuse me, lady. Back. You get back. Why do I get back? Very obvious. You're black. You get back. That's where you belong. She said, I'm going nowhere. Well, like they say in the States, I ain't going nowhere. What do you mean you're not going? You're black. That's where you belong. She had so much self-respect. She refused to get out of that bus. African Americans boycotted the bus system and they had to change the law. Because someone, one person that happened to be an old woman, had so much self-respect and she said, I am not going anywhere. I belong here and this is where I am sitting. See, it is very important what we think of ourselves.